the Cold War saw a whole host of technological advances take place, particularly, and not really surprisingly, in military fields. And fighter aircraft were one of the key places that the respective competitors poured huge amounts of resources and capital, leading to great leaps in capability between the end of the Second World War and up until the collapse of the Soviet Union in 1991. With the importance of air power firmly established by World War II, both factions sought to create the very best fighters they could, so that in the event of an actual conflict breaking out between the United States and the Soviet Union, their respective militaries would be able to control the airspace around the battleground. And though we can all no doubt argue about which side was dominant at whichever particular period during the latter half of the 20th century, as various new fighters came into service, by the end of the standoff, both sides had truly formidable aircraft flying. The United States with their teen series, and the Soviets with the MiG-29 and Su-27 pairing. In fact, probably nothing better demonstrates the evolutionary drive in fighter design created by the Cold War than the fact that all of these aircraft, though admittedly hugely upgraded electronically, basically form the core of the majority of capable air forces to the current day because as the Cold War ended, another generation of jet fighter was about to enter service, the fifth generation. And these, combining stealth characteristics with cutting-edge technology, represented as much a step up from their predecessors as those did to the prior third generation fighters. Nothing quite typifies this like the F-22 Raptor. The pinnacle of the Cold War designs, the F-22 is still arguably the most formidable fighter aircraft to enter service. This aircraft began development in 1981 as the USAF and the DoD recognised the threat that the new MiG-29 and Su-27 represented to American air dominance aspirations. But it was only the fact that the aircraft was well along on its development cycle when the Cold War ended that allowed it to survive the huge cuts in military spending that occurred with the end of the confrontation, and then at much reduced numbers purchased than originally intended. Less fortunate was the Soviet's equivalent to the F-22, the MiG-1.42, which would be limited to this single example, the prototype 1.44. This would also have the provisional service designation of MiG-35 and the NATO codename Flatpak. Sounds Swedish. Had the aircraft achieved service, apparently NATO would have codenamed it Foxglove. Though why they would allocate a new name for the production model baffles me, so I'm not so sure that this is true. But certainly NATO must have suspected at the time that the new aircraft would become a mainstay of the Soviet air forces. The 144's development grew out of a recognition that the Americans would no doubt react to the Soviets fielding of the new MiG and Sukhoi fighters. So in 1979 the Soviets started thinking about what the future of air combat would require. Preliminary studies were then conducted by the big Soviet aircraft builders, with a range of proposals put forward for different roles, but in 1983, MiG was ordered to begin development of a new fifth generation fighter that would be their equivalent to the United States proposed advanced tactical fighter, the program which ultimately led to the F-22. The new design, designated as the MFI, which translates into multifunctional frontline fighter, was to integrate stealth or stealthy characteristics with super maneuverability, cutting edge radar and electronics, the best weaponry available, and the ability to supercruise at supersonic speeds. And to accomplish all this, MiG created an interesting design, the 1.44. The aircraft was a canard delta wing, which combined with an inherently unstable flight profile controlled by a fly-by-wire system, was intended for optimal air combat maneuverability. Combined with large under-fuselage air intakes that kept the twin engines fed during the high angle of attack manoeuvres experienced during hard combat flying, the 144 shares a number of design philosophy similarities with the Eurofighter, a broadly contemporary design which would, had things worked out differently, been one of the 144's principal potential opponents. Indeed, comparisons between the two aircraft has led to speculation that the Eurofighter design provided some inspiration, but if you've seen my video on the YE-8, the original MiG-23, linked to it at the end, then you'll know that MiG and the Soviets had been experimenting with this sort of plan form for decades. 
Plus, the 144 didn't just rely on its aerodynamic profile to make it an expected dogfighter par excellence. Mikoyan also intended to add variable geometry jet exhaust, which would have made the aircraft a truly exceptional acrobatic performer. The engines also would have given the aircraft, theoretically, excellent performance. Powered by two AL-41F turbofans which provided £40,000 of force each, the service aircraft was expected to be capable of a top speed of Mach 2.35, and have the ability to cruise at Mach 1.5 without using its afterburner. Additionally, the MiG-35 was hoped to be far stealthier than previous Soviet aircraft. The airframe, which heavily used aluminium lithium alloys and titanium in its construction for maximum strength to weight saving ratios, was also to be coated in radar absorbent material. Extensive studies were also made on how to make the radar cross-section as small as possible while maintaining the aircraft's combat effectiveness. This led to the conclusion that the aircraft should have its weapons housed in internal bays, same idea reached by the designers of the F-22, but in the 144 prototype this was omitted. All told, the service version of the flat pack or foxglove was anticipated to have 12 internal hardpoints and 8 external underwing ones. Additionally, the new aircraft would be fitted with a new generation of phased array radar to give a previously unparalleled detection and engagement capability. If this all sounds like it might have been a bit ambitious, well, it was. By 1991, Mika Yen was able to get a suitable design into advanced conception and was issued a production order for the 144 demonstration prototype to be built, just in time for the Soviet Union to collapse. To be fair, the ambitious goals Mika Yang set for the 144-42 project might well have been impossible even if the Cold War hadn't ended, but the dissolution of the entire country certainly spelt the aircraft's death knell. Despite this, MiG and the now Russian government persisted with the aircraft. By 1994, the incomplete 144 was able to conduct ground tests, though the aircraft was nowhere near capable of flight. The terrible condition of the Russian economy meant that progress was slowed to a crawl, and in 1997 the Russian government decided to pull the plug on the program, with the single 144 as the only aircraft close to completion, and four of the 142 production aircraft in various stages of construction. Despite this, MiG managed to keep development staggering on until, in the year 2000, the 144 actually took to the air. The aircraft made a top speed of 370 miles per hour and stayed at an altitude of 1,000 meters, which is to be expected for a first flight. But despite the test pilot telling the assembled press present that the aircraft flew well, no further flights took place for another two months. The second flight represented the final one for the aircraft, and it has since then resided in a museum. And the flat pack has been a source of speculation ever since. Some look at the aircraft as one of the greatest of the what-ifs in history, a true Russian answer to the F-22 Raptor. Others point out that the aircraft would seem to have been unlikely to meet such high promise because of the different design philosophies it used, and also that the curtailed test program indicates that actually, the whole aircraft may well have been a dud from the beginning. Certainly MiG's great rival, the Sukhoi company, wasted no time in the aftermath of the failure of the 144 project and it is their latest fighter, the Su-57, which is now Russia's fifth generation fighter. There is also another route of speculation concerning the 144, and a possible link to the development of the Chinese Chengdu J-20. Observers have long wondered about the decision of the Chinese to build their own fifth generation fighter with canards, like the 144. But this is a unique choice in amongst the other designs for 5th gen aircraft, as canards are recognised as being problematic for stealth aircraft. MiG's heavy investment in the 144, and China's subsequent purchasing of copious amounts of Russian military technology post-Cold War, have led to speculation that the J-20 is a development of the earlier aircraft. Indeed, one Russian engineer went on the record as saying that he believed the J-20 was inspired by the MiG-1.44. Personally, I am dubious. While it is certainly possible that the Chinese were able to acquire design data and expertise from MiG, or some of their designers, for use in the J-20, the very different air intakes would indicate that the Chengdu design draws more from studying the design ideas of the F-22 or Su-57 than the 1.44. And the use of canards is hardly unique, 
or indeed unknown to the Chinese, who utilise the concept on their J-10 fighters. But as for the MiG 1.44, well, it will likely be one of those aircraft that people argue about for some time to come. I hope you enjoyed the video. Remember to comment, like, share, subscribe, all that jazz. And have a look at these videos coming up now. Have a good one, everyone, and I'll catch you again soon.